The attack started on Wednesday morning. Two men strapped with AK-47 stormed a satirical magazine in Paris. They said they were avenging the Prophet Muhammad and killed 12 people. <laughs> Charlie Hebdo had been a target for Islamists since it published a caricature of the Prophet in 2006. The payback, when it came on Wednesday 7th of January, was felt as a sucker punch to free speech across the world. Within hours, a hashtag voicing solidarity with the paper's victims was trending on Twitter. But it wasn't just satirists who were targeted. On Thursday, another gunman shot two people, killing a policewoman. He later stormed a kosher supermarket in Paris, shot dead four Jewish shoppers and took 15 hostages. French commandos had stormed the kosher supermarket as the gunmen knelt for evening prayers. By Friday evening, the Charlie Hebdo attackers had been killed in a shootout with police. Viewing figures of rolling news networks spiked by a thousand percent. We need to kill them! On Saturday, the terror attack was over, but the backlash was in full swing. You're in danger, I'm in danger. We're at war. Janine Pirro called for Islamists to be eliminated. Her boss, Rupert Murdoch, said all Muslims were the problem. The brother of a Muslim policeman, Ahmed Meribet, killed by the Charlie Hebdo shooters, made a public plea for the world not to confuse Islam with barbaric extremism. On Sunday, almost four million people marched in unity across France, led by world leaders. A pigeon saluted Charlie Hebdo by crapping on Francois Hollande. But tweeters were quick to notice the hypocrisy of Egyptian, Turkish and Jordanian leaders linking arms in the name of free speech. Israel's Benjamin Netanyahu marched at the front. Five world leaders breadth away from Palestine's Mahmoud Abbas. Bibi's political opponents at home quickly turned that into a computer game. Back in Israel, an ultra-Orthodox Jewish paper ran the image of world leaders marching arm in arm, with all the offensive women airbrushed out. And meanwhile, in Dresden, 25,000 people took part in an anti-Islamization rally. In the UK, Fox News reports caused David Cameron to choke on his porridge. There are actual cities like Birmingham that are totally Muslim, where non-Muslims just simply don't go in. By Monday, news had filtered out of Nigeria. 2,000 people had been massacred by Boko Haram militants. The Secretary General utterly condemns this depraved act at the hands of Boko Haram terrorists. But the West had mostly failed to notice. On Tuesday, the French burials began. In Paris, Ahmed Meribet's coffin was draped with a tricolor. The French Jews were buried in Jerusalem. In Berlin, Angela Merkel joined a Muslim community rally. But elsewhere, the discussion had moved on from solidarity to security and surveillance. While millions had been marching for freedom on Sunday, EU and US ministers had agreed to push through new measures to retain and share airline passenger data for up to five years. It didn't seem to matter that all the suspects in the French attacks had been well known to security services already without these new powers. In the UK, Cameron vowed to fight the fanatical death cult of Islamism with greater internet snooping if elected in May. On Wednesday the 14th, a French comedian was arrested for appearing to support the kosher supermarket killer in a post on Facebook. One week on, we were no closer to agreeing the difference between free speech and incitement. On the same day, Charlie Hebdo went on sale. The cover featured a picture of a tearful Prophet Muhammad holding a Je suis Charlie placard with the headline, All is forgiven. Another defiant statement. It showed how far we actually are from forgiving or forgetting. On the day of the Je suis Charlie march, we came to Paris to speak to Parisians about how they were dealing with the tragic events that had shaken the city. 